All right. Good time. Excellent. Well, like those before me, uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Thomas and Maxime for, for putting all of this together. Uh, you know, this is what a gift you've given to the community uh, during this time, especially when none of us can travel and it's hard to, to connect with people. Uh, it's really great to see uh, so many folks in this community and come together and hear about great science every couple of weeks. And so your efforts are, uh, your efforts are greatly appreciated. Uh, and I feel really privileged to, to get to talk about um, my work today uh, and the work of, more importantly, of my students uh, who've been doing some really beautiful things I'm excited to tell you about. So the things that we do in my group uh, focus on using protein dynamics to report on functional properties, right? And so uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, right? We do 2D IR spectroscopy. We're looking at line shapes. And so we extract information about the frequency, frequency correlation function, usually in the form of this variable, the center line slope as a function of the waiting time in the 2D experiment, right? And we get this uh, center line slope decay. And in, in this particular example, it oscillates. And we can Fourier transform that and we get the spectral density of the low frequency motions of the protein that are interacting with our probe. Uh, and we can use this to report on things like catalysis. Uh, we and others in the community, people like Megan Tilgis and Neil Hunt and Jens Breedenbeck and Carlos Baez and Peter Hamm and Marty Zanni and, and probably others I'm forgetting, right? Lots of folks who are working on this, trying to understand things like molecular recognition and allosteri. Uh, things related to enzyme function with the dreams of things like, can we do drug discovery? Uh, can we uh, really assay some of these properties uh, for real uh, biological applications? And one of the keys to that, uh, I think one of the, the ongoing dreams that people in the community uh, articulate is the idea of using these methods in a high throughput screening format. And the problem with being able to do this at scale with lots of, of proteins uh, in, a, in a high throughput screening kind of way, quite simply, is that 2D IR is a slow technique. Uh, as I was uh, putting this talk together, I realized it's actually literally 20 years ago this week that I started my postdoc in Andre Tokmakov's group uh, in the very first days of 2D IR spectroscopy, uh, taking some of, the, some of the first uh, 2D IR measurements, uh, time domain 2D IR measurements. Um, and uh, so I wanted to actually talk about some of those earliest measurements because the idea of accelerating uh, the rate of the experiment has, has been a theme of the field for a long time, right? The very first 2D IR experiment I uh, bore witness to, I didn't actually collect the data. This was, this was work done by Munira Khalil, who's now uh, on the faculty at Washington and Nuri Demirdevan, who, who were graduate students with Andre at the time. They were working on rhodium dicarbonyl, which we all now know is like this really bright chromophore and a really easy experiment. But we were naive. We didn't really know how to do these things. We took a rephasing spectrum, time, time, no array detectors, you know, scanning the stages at two femtosecond steps for 10 picoseconds. So we didn't do any undersampling. There was no rotating frame. There was no pulse shaper. There was none of that stuff. 25 million data points. We were reading everything with a lock-in amplifier at four milliseconds per point. And you can quickly do some math to conclude that if you do that, it will take you 24 hours to collect a single 2D IR spectrum, one waiting time, and that just the rephasing spectrum. Now, obviously we got better. Uh, we introduced array detectors, right? We, Marty Zanni uh, introduced this pulse shaper that has, has changed our lives uh, in a lot of ways. And yet, 2D IR spectroscopy in a lot of ways is still not really a fast technique. If you want to extract the protein dynamics, like what I showed you at the beginning, uh, it turns out you still have to, to do a lot of layers of measurement and averaging. And so I want to walk you through all that because understanding why it's still not a fast technique is key to knowing how to speed things up. So I'm going to sort of march through an analysis of counting up the number of laser shots it takes to do the kind of measurement uh, that, that we routinely do. So uh, for the enzyme formate dehydrogenase, we're looking at the azide anion. So that dephases relatively quickly. Four picoseconds, we can scan the coherence time. We'll work in the rotating frame, taking 24 femtosecond steps. That means we need 167 coherence time points. And we're going to use a four pulse phase cycle to isolate the signal. So 167 by four. Uh, now, typically, that's going to get us then four points at each coherence time, and that's not going to give good enough signal noise. We've got one millimolar samples, even with something as bright as azide, that's not going to be enough. And so we're going to average those spectra about 300 times. 
in order to get a single 2D IR spectrum at one waiting time with pretty good signal noise. And then we're gonna slice up that center line and, and measure the center line slope. And that gets us one point on the center line slope as a function of waiting time plot. And then we'll do that over and over again for the different waiting times. And we'll fill out this plot. And if we really wanna fill out the whole plot, we're gonna need to take a lot of waiting time points. And so typically for us, that means zero to five picoseconds in waiting time and about 50 femtosecond steps for a total of 101 different waiting time points. What I want you to notice though, and we're gonna talk about this more in a little bit, the centerline slope variable is actually kind of a noisy observable. Um, if you look at these and you look at the data I showed you earlier, it's hard to believe that uh, you can ever get anything as clean as those oscillations to come out of this. There's a lot of scatter in these values. Uh, and so what we end up having to do is, is measure multiple replicates uh, of this centerline slope decay. And in practice, we will typically measure 20 to 25 replicates uh, of that decay. So that we're averaging another 25 of those centerline slope values for each waiting time. And if you calculate all that up and you say, we never lose any laser shots in the process, it should require five times 10 to the eighth individual laser shots. We collect data at a one kilohertz repetition rate. So you can quickly do the math and conclude that to collect these data without losing a laser shot ought to take six days. Of course, in practice, anybody who does these things routinely knows that you're not gonna keep your laser perfectly stable uh, running day and night for six days. You're gonna to have to come in from time to time and just peek things up a little. Uh, things may have drifted and you may have to repeat some things. And so usually we would budget that we were gonna to expect to spend eight to 10 days to collect the centerline slope decay for a single protein sample, eight to 10 days. So eight to 10 days, that's not so great. Uh, and it's certainly a long, long way from high throughput screening. And so what I wanna tell you about today is efforts to turn eight to 10 days into something less than a minute, right? That's really your goal. If you're gonna screen a few hundred of these, you really need to be able to do this experiment in about a minute or less. And uh, I'm gonna tell you about some, some things we've done uh, today that, um, that get to uh, something like that time scale. So the first one of these is one that we uh, have, have worked on for a little bit. Uh, it's already been published. This is edge pixel referencing. And the idea here is to improve the signal noise ratio of the 2D IR experiment so that instead of averaging 300 scans, we can average something considerably less than that. We can improve the quality of the data we get out of here uh, and just generally do less averaging to get these measurements. To know how edge pixel referencing works, I first wanna look a little bit at where noise in a 2D IR spectrum comes from. So we're gonna look at this uh, as a pump probe because we do it in the pump probe geometry. It looks mostly like a pump probe experiment. So the top panel here shows the intensity of our probe spectrum as a function of frequency. Uh, pump on and pump off. You can see the adjacent, uh, the adjacent uh, snapshots, uh, the adjacent frames. And of course, what do we do, right? We take uh, the difference in intensity divided by the intensity in a logarithm and calculate delta OD. Uh, and that gets us the pump probe signal we're all used to seeing down here. What I want you to pay attention to though is not the signal itself. That's kind of boring in this case. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to is the baseline because the baseline fluctuations here are about as big as the signal. This is the big problem uh, in these kind of heterodyne spectroscopies is that the baseline noise that comes as is obvious from the shot to shot fluctuations of the probe beam, the heterodyning beam uh, is a huge source of noise in these experiments. And so unpacking where all the, the noise sources in this measurement are, uh, we have detector noise, the actual readout noise of the individual pixels, which on an intensity basis is relatively constant. So when I calculate delta OD and I normalize by intensity means that the detector noise will scale as one over the intensity on that pixel. That's why the noise blows up out here at the edges where we don't have very much light. The next layer of noise is the statistics of photon counting, the Poisson statistics that come out because the intensity is not actually a continuous variable, it's a discrete variable uh, due to the quantum nature of light. And it scales as the square root of the number of photons, which when I calculate delta OD and normalize to the intensity means it scales as one over the square root of the intensity. These together are something like the noise floor of a particular detection system. Once you've chosen your detector, it has whatever well depth it has, that limits the maximum intensity you can put on there. It has whatever readout noise uh, it has on, on each channel. Uh, 
uh, that sets the noise floor of your detector. After that, everything com else comes down to the local shot to shot noise of the, the local oscillator. I want you to notice that these together show up as something like plus or minus two milliod on this plot. That's significant because when we go look at the actual shot to shot noise, which on a delta I basis scales as the intensity, which means it's a constant in delta OD, it's going to be something like plus or minus 10 milli OD of noise that comes just because from one laser shot to the next, we don't get exactly the same amount of probe light onto our detector. This is the shot to shot fluctuations of our source, and this is almost always the dominant source of noise. Now, anybody who's been around this field long enough knows there's an answer to this problem. And the answer to this problem is referencing, right? So you've got your signal spectrometer and it's bouncing around all over the place and isn't that terrible. And so you put a beam splitter in and you pick off a portion of that probe beam and you send it around to a reference spectrometer. And now you're going to use that reference spectrometer and reference to that. And as you reference to that reference spectrometer, if everything's ideal, your reference array should bounce around in the same way that your signal array does. And if you subtract these two, you should get a nice zero baseline. In practice, this never quite works as well as you hope. And it's because that means that everything from the beam splitter on has to be as perfectly matched as you can get it in order to get this to work. Your array detectors, your spectrometers, right? All the conditions have to be as neatly matched as you can. It's a lot of careful, tedious alignment and matching the conditions and, and the properties of your detectors. Uh, this turns out to be a challenge. It can work and it can work to the tune of a factor of eight to 10. Uh, but it's really hard in practice to set up and maintain. So Nanway Gay's group came up with a solution for this problem. They realized that the reference array still contains all of the information that's in the signal array. It's just there's this mapping problem that it gets distorted by a detection system that has some different sensitivities. And so you can calibrate a linear transformation matrix that will give rise to a new reference array spectrum. And that if you do that, you can minimize the difference between these two things and significantly improve the quality of your referencing. So you use a second spectrometer, you collect a bunch of signal and reference shots to calibrate this linear transformation matrix, and then you apply that linear transformation matrix on a shot-to-shot -shot basis to your referencing, and you dramatically improve uh, the quality of your response. Now, they showed that you can, in fact, in favorable cases, get down to the noise floor of your detector if you use uh, careful calibration. The catch is you still need a second detector. And so one of the things we wondered uh, looking at our data is, hey, we know that when we look at the signal array, the portion of the array that we care about where their signal is right here in the middle and out here in the edges, Right out here in the edges where we still have some spectral intensity, there's no signal. And we don't actually care about that part of the spectrum, but that part of the spectrum contains most of the information about the shot to shot fluctuations. And so could we use those two windows out on the edges as a set of reference arrays? Now, clearly if we just applied those directly, that would perfectly cancel, but it wouldn't do anything in the middle. But if we use this same idea of using those little edge pixel boxes, those bins of boxes on either side of our spectrum to then calibrate with that linear transformation matrix and the average spectrum, we can reconstruct a reference array that builds off of these edge pixels and use that then as our referencing source. And this then minimizes the noise. This is just processing the data differently. Notice there's no hardware difference here. I use the same signal array that I was using without referencing. And all I do is take these two chunks uh, of, of spectral uh, intensity and use them with this algorithm uh, to reference to my signal array. And, and I'm able to eliminate the noise. So, the idea works really great, but of course the immediate question is, but now I'm taking a part of the thing that carries signal, right? And in principle, even those edge pixels could carry some signal. 
and I'm using that to correct the noise in my data, don't I have to worry about that distorting my answer? And so we spent a lot of time uh, in this paper trying to not only demonstrate how the technique works, but then to understand the nature of the distortions it can introduce. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about how well it works, right? So here's the noise of the unreferenced data in MillieOD, right? If we average in a little bit, uh, we get on the order of four and a half to five uh, milli-delta OD of noise in the unreferenced uh, probe spectrum. If you do second spectrometer referencing, you can make that better significantly. Uh, again, a factor of, of you know, eight to 10 is not hard at all. Strikingly, what we find is we do even better with edge pixel referencing. And in fact, we can, with edge pixel referencing, we found we can really push up and maybe even a little below what we predict theoretically to be the shot noise limit, that's, we suspect that's tied up actually in the fact that we're convolving the spectral response across several pixels. Uh, and then when we integrate those to reference, uh, it's effectively like binning pixels together. And so we're, we're effectively able to push the shot noise a little bit lower that way. Uh, so edge pixel referencing works. We can push the noise down by something like uh, an order of magnitude, 10 to 20 easily. Uh, the question is, does it distort the data? And so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I want to I want to talk about another approach we've we've introduced as well. Uh, but I'll quickly show you that if you if you apply this, you can uh, compare the results from second spectrometer referencing to the results from referencing with edge pixels. Uh, and in red is the edge pixel referencing, in blue is the second spectrometer referencing, and you can see these really lie right on top of each other. Uh, a more statistical analysis, right, to calculate the difference and, and see where they lie within the 95% confidence interval says that these are really statistically identical uh, to one another. So edge pixel referencing really does work. It doesn't distort the line shape, um, at least not in the, the favorable case where you don't have signal out there. But what if you really try to break it? What if you prepare a sample in which you introduce a chromophore that sits right in your edge pixel region, right? So we made a sample with methyl thiocyanate, which is, which is what we were using uh, to, to test all of these ideas, and then uh, benzonitrile, which has a peak that shows up right here in the region, a transition shows up right here in the region where we want to do our edge pixel referencing. In blue is the response, the pump probe response from second spectrometer referencing, and you can see you get the appropriate signals. And in red is the pump probe spectrum that you get from edge pixel referencing. And not surprisingly, when you have these features that sit, now you're forcing all of that to zero, that completely distorts what shows up in your pump probe spectrum. And it might seem like this is, uh, this is a bad situation, but in fact, if you go ahead and measure the 2DIR spectrum, so on the left here, I've got the 2DIR spectrum from second spectrometer referencing, where I get my pair of peaks for methyl thiocyanate, my pair of peaks for benzonitrile, everything looks just exactly like I expect. The gray areas mark the regions of the probe axis where we're edge pixel referencing, so right on top of that peak pair for benzonitrile. And in the edge pixel reference spectrum, of course, I have nothing in that region of space because I have explicitly forced the system to make that zero. The key thing is that that happens at the carrier frequency in omega-1 that corresponds to the benzonitrile transition. And so, yes, in the pump probe spectrum, I do end up with all those distortions, but all those distortions in the 2D spectrum actually end up coming out right on top of the carrier frequency of benzonitrile and do not distort things at the frequency of methyl thiocyanate. And so even if I have things in the edge pixel reference region, as long as I don't care about what's in the spectrum uh, over here at the frequency of benzonitrile, as long as all I care about is this uh, cyano, uh, uh, this thiocyanate response, if that's all I care about, then I can still use edge pixel referencing even when there are signals that show up in the edge pixel region. Uh, and we actually have demonstrated this in the context of, uh, of our enzyme experiments, right? So formate dehydrogenase, one millimolar with uh, NAD and azide, where before we were taking eight days to collect the entire centerline slope decay for each mutant. After implementing edge pixel referencing, we substantially reduced the amount of averaging. We can now do that same experiment in about four hours of measurement time 
uh, averaging considerably less and getting much higher quality data. So this is a huge effect, a 50 fold reduction in measurement time that we can get uh, out of employing this edge pixel referencing scheme. And indeed, the, the key thing to emphasize is that this isn't a hardware implementation. This is taking the exact same data, but now just processing it to account for this edge pixel referencing. So you can implement this entirely in software. That's the first little story I wanna tell you about. Um, so we, we got a factor of 50 out of that. Uh, eight days now turns into four hours, that's big, um, but four hours still isn't enough to get you anywhere in the neighborhood of, of um, high throughput screening. And so the next thing I wanna tell you about actually has to do with how we go about extracting the dynamics from the 2D IR data, because there's a lot of room to do better there. And in particular, I'm gonna show you that fitting the 2D IR spectrum to extract the dynamics directly is gonna win. Uh, and win by a lot. The reason for that is that the centerline slope, as I mentioned before, is a noisy observable. And people who've done a lot with the centerline slope kind of know this, we never talk about it. Uh, I, I file this under people in glass houses don't throw rocks. Um, you don't, you don't want to tear down the, the technique that you depend on for your livelihood. Uh, but everybody who does it kind of knows that the centerline slope is a problem. So let's unpack how the centerline slope works. I'm going to do this in the context of some simulated data. So I've got simulated data here in which we've used a double Kubo line shape model uh, with a homogeneous dephasing contribution. And then we've added Gaussian noise to get to a total signal to noise at time zero of about 500 to one, right? And so when you collect the 2D IR spectra and you wanna do the center line slope, right? You're gonna take the vertical slices uh, in the pump frequency. You're gonna find the maximum in the probe frequency. That becomes the sequence of points corresponding to the center line. You fit that sequence of points uh, to a line and the slope of that line uh, as a function of waiting time is what gives you the center line slope decay. And so we did this with a bunch of trials. I, again, 500 to one signal noise, so really good signal noise. And we start mapping this out and the data look pretty good, right? The center line slope decays come out pretty nicely. But if you actually look at this on a log scale, you start to see the nature of the problem. There is real scatter over here, particularly uh, at late times in, uh, in the values of the center line slope. Right, there become subtle distortions due to the small amount of noise, particularly in, in the parts of the spectrum that have lower signal noise when you get to long waiting times. And this leads to scatter that distorts the long time constant. And now here's the problem with these frequency correlation functions is that often we're fitting these things to a bi-exponential. And all of us who have been doing kinetics kinds of problems long enough know that all of the parameters in a bi-exponential are highly covariant. If I start introducing distortions in the long time constant, all the rest of the parameters change in a way that's covariant, and it can be a really significant effect. And so in fact, if I take these 35 replicates, these 35 measurements, and I look at the center line slope parameters, now I'm gonna take those uh, parameters that come out of the bi-exponential fit, time constants and relative amplitudes, I'm gonna fit them to a linear absorption spectrum to get the total amplitudes, delta one squared and delta two squared and the homogeneous dephasing time. And here, just to give the center line slope the best chance possible, I fit to a linear absorption spectrum with no noise. So the only place where I have noise is the 2D IR spectrum signal to noise 500 to one, which is better than what is typical uh, experimentally. And what you see for each of these parameters, now I've normalized uh, the fit parameters that come out of the center line slope analysis to the true value, which I know because it's simulated data, that's why uh, comparing to simulated data is so important, right? So if the center line slope are working well, all of these should be clustered around one, and we would hope for a relatively narrow band of values. In fact, what we see is that there's significant deviations <laughs> from one, systematic deviations, and there's huge scatter, 50% error in some cases uh, over the course of the 35 trials. And indeed, the, if you looked closely at individual pairs, there's strong covariance uh, in the parameters, uh, unsurprisingly. Now this gets better as we've shown experimentally, if you go ahead and average those things, the actual errors are smaller, right? The actual errors in the reported values will be on the order of 10 or 15% compared to the true value 
uh, you can, you know, you got a little bit tighter error bars than what the scatter of the point shows over here, right? Things aren't quite as bad as it might look, but you have to average over all those trials in order to get things that are close enough to be any good. And this, of course, is, is the real problem with the center line slope. It's a noisy observable, and you can average out a lot of that noise, but that takes more measurements, it takes more time. So what do you do instead? Well, there are lots of other alternatives to the center line slope, and many people on, uh, on this call, uh, on this Zoom meeting, uh, have been people working on those things from the ellipticity to the inhomogeneity index and uh, the peak shift, right? There are lots of things you could do. Um, but one of the things uh, about having a great student, uh, and a student especially, is that they haven't been doing this for 20 years. And so they'll ask a really naive question like, why don't we just go fit the spectra? Uh, and you say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's really hard, right? These, these equations are complicated, right? And why is it complicated? Because the signal as a function of omega-3 and waiting time and T1 is a Fourier transform of these rephasing and non-rephasing terms. And we've got the carrier frequencies and the line shape functions and the line shape functions are all this double integral of the correlation function. And all together, you've got a lot of parameters. Really, you need nine parameters to fit this. And it turns out when we actually go do it in practice, we need a, a couple more than that. Um, you need a lot of parameters. You've got a complicated multidimensional space. It's really hard to get these things to converge cleanly. They can get trapped. Uh, in, in intermediate results that are not the most stable minima. Uh, and so this turns out not to be a trivial problem to solve. People have done it, uh, again, including some of the folks on here, but nobody in practice does this anymore. It's computationally very intensive. And if you wanna collect lots of data, uh, it, it's really hard. You've got to fit to a lot of parameters and you're more likely to get stuck in a minimum than you are to ever get a result out that looks like it means anything. Nevertheless, I have a really diligent student uh, who spent a lot of time studying optimization algorithms and figured out some things to do this and fitting the spectra actually works. Now, I'm not gonna give you all the details because it's technical and it's complicated. I will say that this is just a fitting routine, right? It's just a, a minimization. So there's a cost function and you're gonna minimize the cost function. He's developed a tool called the scale invariant gradient norm that we're gonna use both as a convergence criterion and as a way to know when to pop out of an intermediate trapped state uh, and restart the, the, the fit. You can look at the quality of the fit to the data. And again, these are our simulated data signal noise of 500 down here. And you can see when this thing converges, it converges really nicely. You get beautiful fits to the data. Uh, and then these three panels are gonna show us uh, the actual parameters that you go and fit. So anharmonic shift and zero to one transition frequency, the amplitudes and time constants of the Kubo parameters. So we've got two of those. And then uh, the vibrational relaxation rate and the dephasing rate, where we fit them as rate constants rather than lifetimes. Uh, it turns out to be a little bit more stable to do it that way. And we land right on the true values almost perfectly every time. What I will have you notice if we watch this a little bit, uh, at points you will see these red triangles pop up. And those red triangles pop up because the system had started out somewhere and it moved along and it found itself trapped in something like a local minimum. Uh, it found itself in a trap state where it could no longer continue descent towards uh, the, the, the global minimum, the best fit. Uh, and so when it does that, we'll pop the thing out to a new random starting place uh, in parameter space and start it over. Uh, and systematically, that consistently works to get us eventually uh, into, into the, the global minimum. We always end up landing on these parameter points. And you'll see, right, it gets stuck somewhere and it's not you know, we're just not dropping the scale invariant gradient norm, even though the cost function went down. And then all of a sudden, 
boom, the scale invariant gradient norm drops below 10 to the minus nine, and then you know you've converged. So the scale invariant gradient norm is a really important feature that he's developed. Uh, and it's, it's some of the magic here. The important other thing to note is that computationally, historically, this has been a pretty intensive set of calculations. He's consistently getting it to work these days on his laptop, so not a fancy computer, in about two minutes with the simulated data. It scales linearly with the number of data points, it scales linearly with the number of parameters. So this is something that seems really scalable. So in principle, it works. The question is, how well does it compare to, uh, to what we've been doing with the centerline slope? And so here are the same 35 trials, the same simulated data trials uh, with the Gaussian noise. The blue are still the centerline slope results that I showed you before, and in red, are the results of fitting those same 35 trials uh, to the model, right, with two uh, Kubo amplitudes, two Kubo time constants, and a homogeneous dephasing time. What you see is that they are clustered tightly around the two values and show uh, a much narrower scatter. It's clear that fitting the spectra extracts the data, the dynamics information with much higher fidelity than what we were able to do with the centerline slope. And of course, if you go ahead and average those, uh, given the, the small scatter, right, the 95% the, uh, confidence intervals leave uh, an uncertainty in those parameters that in some cases uh, is ridiculously small uh, on the order of smaller than the, the, the marker size. Okay, great. So we can do that in the context of simulated data. But the real question is, how well does it work with actual experimental data? And can we begin to leverage this to, to actually accelerate data collection? Um, so we played with this a little bit uh, in the context of methyl thiocyanate uh, in DMSO. Again, methyl thiocyanate's a really weak chromophore. Uh, we're operating now at about 200 times the concentration we would work at for this chromophore in an enzyme. Uh, and we're putting it in DMSO where we don't have any background absorbance. So we're, we're working in a system that's a, a pretty good uh, test case, uh, favorable test case for us. But we didn't try very hard. Signal to noise ratio here is only 50 to one as opposed to the 500 to one we used for the simulated data. And now we're gonna fit these things for one replicate at each waiting time. And we're gonna do those fits. Now, the thing you need to know about uh, methyl thiocyanate and DMSO is that it fits really well to a single Kubo model. So one amplitude and, and time constant in the correlation function plus a homogeneous dephasing time. The important thing I wanna show you about these data is that, so here's the Kubo amplitude, time constant and homogeneous dephasing time. Notice the scale here. These are not moving around much. Across the bottom, what we've done experimentally, we collected data for 45 waiting times, but we don't have to analyze all 45 waiting times. We can analyze only a portion of them. You pick 22, take every other point. Take 15, nine, five, three. What if we only take two waiting times, one at the beginning and one at the end and fit those? And what I want you to notice is that the range we're plotting over here is small, right? 100 couple hundred femtoseconds of variation uh, in the Kubo time constant. And we get really basically the same answer for 45 waiting times as we would get for two waiting times. These are one replicate at each waiting time, signal noise of 50. And we get the same answer for two waiting times that we get for 45. In principle, if I compare back to what we had to do for formate dehydrogenase, where over five picoseconds, we took 100 waiting times and 25 replicates, that leaves us with the potential for a 2,500 fold reduction in the number of measurements. Now, in practice for something like formate dehydrogenase, where we have a much more complicated correlation function, I don't think we're gonna get away with two waiting time points. But if we got away with 10 or 15 or 20 instead of 100, that's still an enormous reduction uh, in the number of individual points we have to measure. And we're gonna be able to do that for maybe one replicate. Uh, and so this has the potential to be uh, really transformative in terms of our ability to accurately extract the correlation function parameters from the 2DIR spectra. And importantly, notice 
we're not doing anything with infrared absorption spectra at this point. This is fitting entirely the, all of the information for the correlation function just out of the 2D IR spectra alone. So together, uh, edge pixel referencing buys us something like a factor of 50. So eight days turns into four hours. Conservatively, if we got something like 250 times faster using uh, fitting of the, the model uh, to extract the dynamics instead of the centerline slope, conceivably, we think we could be in the neighborhood of making these measurements in a minute or less. Uh, and that's without any kind of real hardware solutions. What if we up the repetition rate, right? There are people now who have 10 or 100 kilohertz laser systems. There are all kinds of things you could do from here uh, that I think leave us in a place where we believe we are on the cusp of doing uh, 2D IR spectroscopy in a high throughput screening fashion. Uh, one of the great privileges of, of getting to do science in academia is getting to work with really outstanding students. Right now, I've got a fantastic group of really wonderful students shown here. Uh, all of the work today, or almost all of the work today I've told you about is the work of one really talented student, Kevin Robin. Uh, Kevin has done phenomenal things, continues to do great things. The FDH data that I showed you were collected by uh, Evan Schroeder. Uh, funding for these projects comes from the NIH and the National Science Foundation. And with that, I will thank you all for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. So yeah, the floor is open for questions. That was already a question uh, from uh, Jakob. Uh, so Jakob, you can unmute and talk. I promoted you. No, I can read then the question. Uh, and the question is why does your simulation fit uh, not get stuck at a local minimum with a low sign? Yes, and the scale invariant gradient norm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it turns out as a, it is a property of that function itself. Um, it's the technical details are are significant. And uh, in the paper we're developing, we're actually just getting ready to submit, we actually go through significant analysis of this. Uh, this, this scale invariant gradient norm is, is a really cool feature for an optimization algorithm, um, both because it is a better convergence criterion than just using uh, convergence of parameters. Convergence of parameters turns out not to be a sufficiently robust way to do this. Uh, so the scale invariant gradient norm is better for that. It's also the features of its dependence, uh, its functional dependence on iteration number can tell you a lot about whether you are overfitting or underfitting the data as well. And so this, this scale invariant gradient norm has some real useful properties uh, as well for being able to modify uh, and adjust the model on the fly. And so we're not doing that yet, but it's, uh, it's a feature of the scale invariant gradient norm. Great question. So I think um, John Wright was first of the remaining questions. John? Chris, yeah. can you hear me okay? I can. So uh, really pretty talk. Um, let's say that I'm going to do uh, drugs curating because I sure. really like your methodology. Um, so I'm wondering, what is it about this uh, method that I would actually want to use it for drug screening? And uh, the actual samples that I would be using would be different than the simple ones that you have. So what would you envision to be future issues? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, so how would I wanna use this for drug screening? Uh, the answer to that comes down to what does protein dynamics tell you uh, about things like drug binding? And so right. uh, there are good reasons to believe we've got uh, some early data that we're working on expanding uh, about being able to show that binding allosteric inhibitors changes the dynamics at the active site. Um, right, those kinds of things are the, are the strategies you would use. Um, it, one of the tricky things about protein-protein interactions, you can often find that 
you know, two proteins have interacted, but it's hard sometimes to distinguish they interacted in a way that leads to agglomeration and crashing out a solution from they interacted in a productive way. And you could imagine dynamics being a, a real time measure of those kinds of things. So it all goes down to how are the interactions you're interested in encoded in the dynamics? And that's something uh, that I think the field still needs to, to work to continue to develop. Peter Hamm has done some really beautiful stuff on uh, these kinds of questions uh, with Alistair, uh, Megan and, and Carlos have done some stuff with various things binding and showing how molecular recognition uh, shows up as, as signatures in, in dynamics. Um, and so, but I think that's, we're kind of at the early stages and part of it is that it's really hard to collect the data. Uh, and so being able to, to just measure these things faster, uh, I think will help a lot. And uh, the uh, complication of other kinds of uh, more complicated proteins? I actually think there are two issues there. Uh, one is that if you, so, so most of the protein data I showed you today was, was for azide and FDH. And right, that's a nice system because azide is a really strong chromophore. Um, if you go to more interesting proteins, you're not going to be able to bind azide. You're going to have to use other things, cyanophenylalanine uh, or um, you know, cyan you know, cyanylated cysteines or other things, all of which are weaker chromophores. And you start to run up against problems of the water background. And so being able uh, to subtract the water background in real time is going to be really important. Uh, and then uh, and then after that, it's just a matter of likely, you know, you're not going to get simple, uh, single Kubo or double Kubo line shapes, you're going to get things that oscillate and more com and it's all scalable, right? The fitting algorithm will do more complicated uh, line shapes. Uh, it's just a matter of, of having to uh, run a little bit longer. And so we've, we've done playing with uh, more complicated line shape functions and you can, you can do that. Uh, it's just a matter of, of working with the line shape function. Okay, thanks. Okay, then in order of appearance, uh, Jens? Uh -huh. Please go ahead. I don't know how I actually ended up in this discussion here because I didn't press any button. So, uh, but anyway, now I'm in already. I can just uh, say, Chris, great talk. And I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to see the publication on the uh, fitting uh, algorithm. So thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, coming soon. Oh, that was fast. Okay, the next was, I, I, I see you, Hoshi Young, but the next was uh, uh, Zach Armstrong. Please go ahead. I've got a similar question to, to John's question, um, mm -hmm. and maybe it's something that you're still exploring, but in your experience looking at different, like binding different things to the proteins, does the, does the fundamental physics ever change? Like, do you suddenly go from a bi-exponential correlation function to a mono-exponential one? And yes. how good is the fitting <laughs> routine at saying, oh, it looks like you need to add another parameter here? Yeah, great question. The answer is yes. Indeed, one of the things that happens with proteins uh, is, yeah, if you... Uh, bind a cofactor or take a cofactor away, uh, even as simple as uh, in FDH, if you change from NAD to NADH cofactor, uh, the oscillations in NADH basically go away, not quite, uh, but, but they're much attenuated. Some of them do completely go away. And so, yeah, you can get really significant changes. Uh, we are just starting to explore. Okay, so the easy thing to do, right, is that you can know that your model is wrong because we can easily identify under or overfitting. Uh, the tricky thing is which parameters should I add and how many, right, to get the new model. Uh, and so we are working with the system, you know, to try and, and add functionality to be able to modify uh, the parameter, you know, the, the model on the fly and then have it generate the scale invariant gradient norm and refine to tell you what the best model is. I anticipate uh, for complicated things, that's gonna take a lot longer. Um, but if we get to that point, we can, you know, at this point we're working on a laptop, we can code this with GPUs and CUDA. Uh, and from where we are now, it'll go in order of magnitude faster easily. Uh, and, and I think we could then scale to much more complicated systems and have it adaptively adjust the, the model on the fly. Exciting work. Okay, the next question is coming from an anonymous attendee. So I will read that. What would you comment about 
the using of your processing technique to study chemical reactions in real time? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we're not really actually looking at reactions right now. I mean, if you were going to do reactions, presumably you'd be doing like exchange spectroscopy or something. We're certainly not uh, at a stage where we're including that level of complication. Uh, you know, I think when you've started to figure out how the model fitting works in principle, uh, figuring out how to introduce that is just extra layers of complication in the fitting routine. Uh, and so at some point it just becomes a matter of, can you add enough, enough pieces, you know, enough complexity to the model uh, to be able to put that in and fit it. So I think in principle, you could do it. I don't, I, that's not something we're interested in doing right now, but, uh, but you could, I suppose, yeah. Okay, uh, now, uh, Jose Young, your turn, please ask. You have to mute. You're muted. Oh, no, he's not, but I can't hear you. We cannot hear you. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, Megan. I think he's returning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Megan, uh, now you can ask your question. Hello, Megan. Okay. Oh, sorry. That? I'm here. Yeah, go ahead, please. I just, uh, I didn't th think I had uh, permission. I was just wondering if you did try to test the method. And I guess, uh, you, I think it had 200 millimolar. Did you ever yeah. try to go down to, you know, we, there's, I often find a lot of these methods are viable at high concentrations or with high signals. But then when I go and right. try to do like a one millimolar sample or something, it doesn't work out. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, great, great question. Uh, for the experimental trial, right, we, we did it at a signal to noise of 50 to 1. So we were at high concentration, but we actually used very low pump power um, so that we could operate under conditions where we just had crummy signal to noise. Having said that, the real problem, as you know all too well, with these low signal noise protein samples is the water background. Uh, and we haven't pushed up against the water background and fought that problem yet. Uh, we've got some strategies in mind for how we can uh, actively background subtract, and we're going to try and do that. But I, you know, that there is some worry that that starts to become a problem that distorts the signal in ways that are hard to account for. If it came to that, right, you could you could conceivably model that in. One of the nice things about modeling everything, right, is that you could model that into the model and just scale it as part of the fit. Um, but it gets a lot more complicated. But yeah, that's my big worry in real proteins is, is the water background more than the signal noise. Okay, well, I look forward to you solving that problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, Hoshi Young, you're back. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you oh, now. Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah, great talk and uh, wonderful uh, result. Actually, you, you have answered most of the uh, the, the question that I have basically is like, you know, what if it's three cubo and, and higher yeah. and also what if it's non-exponential and, yeah. and, you know, and especially the oscillation, right? So yes. do you have to at least know how to sample at the Nyquist, frequent, uh, Nyquist rate on the TW steps or how do you go about, uh, you know, settling the, the, the oscillation? Yeah, so actually I got an idea and we haven't tested it yet. So this is really speculative, right? But I speculate that I'm not sure we need to actually sample all the oscillations in order to fit them well. Because remember what the fitting routine is doing is it's fitting the whole 2D IR line shape at each waiting time. And so whatever that tilt is, it's gonna be that complicated interference between all of the oscillatory components of the correlation function. And so as long as you hit enough waiting times, uh, I don't think you actually need to really fully sample it because you're not necessarily fitting to resolve the oscillations like you would for the center line slope. You only need to constrain it so that you get the line shape right at every one of those points. And so you've got more information than just the correlation. Uh, you've got the whole 2D IR line shape and you have to fit to all of that for all of those waiting times simultaneously. So my, again, we haven't tested it, but my speculation is we're gonna end up being able to sample significantly less and still capture the oscillations in much the same way, right? If you think about the exponential decay, none of us thinks we could fit the exponential decay with two waiting time points. 
but we've got more information in the actual fits. And so we actually get the full exponential time constant spot on, even though we only use two waiting time points. Thank you. Paul has a question. Hey, Chris, um, my favorite subject. So thanks for giving an amazing <laughs> talk on it. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so a quick comment and, and the question. So the comment is just, it's gonna be really interesting to see how the increase in rate, rep rates with, with your turbium systems sort of gives you the benefit because at the same time, they're much more stable. So rep right. approaches are not giving you, you know, they're just not necessary. So that, that's, yeah. that's a sort of comment. It'll be really interesting to see where that goes, uh, rep rate versus pulse energy and all that. Yep. Um, uh, and, and if you have any comments on that, very, very welcome. But my, my question is this, is that um, if you subtract your fitted uh, 2DIR spectrum from the raw data and then look at that, uh -huh. um, does that give you more information, uh, yes. for example, about the oscillations? Well, more importantly, so there's an interesting thing that happens. Uh, and, and you and I were talking about this not that long ago when you visited my group, right? Um, when you do real experimental data, if you look really down close to the baseline, it's never just the one peak that you have. There's all kinds of other stuff there. There's often stuff along the diagonal. Uh, and so we've done this analysis, right? You do the model fitting, you get a beautiful fit, you subtract it off and you see what's left. Uh, and there are interesting things that oscillate. Uh, there are interesting stuff along the diagonal. And we're starting to pick apart what we think those things are. Uh, and, and, you know, so there are hot band transitions that will show up. And I think there are probably low frequency motions of the, uh, of the molecule that are going to be coupled to the high frequency motion. And if you look down in the noise, you can see those coherent excitations from those low frequency modes. I think all of that stuff is present uh, it, down in the baseline. And usually, right, when, when all of us draw these 2D IR spectra, we're really careful with our contour plots to hide all of that stuff so we don't have to talk about it. Um, <laughs> There's some pulse shaper artifact or something. <laughs> there could even be some pulse shaper artifacts or something, but uh, I won't say that because Chris Middleton's here and he's been good to me. <laughs> oh, an interferometer artifact then. <laughs> right, it's an interferometer artifact. That's what it is. <laughs> That's a, a beautiful answer. Very, very exciting to, yeah. to, to see some of those things you're observing. Okay, uh, Luke is the next. Hi, Chris, I, I really enjoyed your talk. I have a question about the uh, robustness of your fitting uh, routine. If you would have um, a low anhydronicities like overlapping excited state and uh, bleach absorptions. Yeah. Uh, so far, it seems to be very robust in that case. We've played with the parameters in our simulations a lot to try and figure out how to break it. Uh, and so far, we haven't been able to find conditions under which it breaks, but that's one of the things we're working on. Yeah, no, it seems, it seems to be very good in the case of small anharmonicities. I think it's okay. Uh, okay. That seems not to be a problem. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Because I, I also would like to ask a question about the first part of your talk that sure. uh, appears to be kind of, you know, uh, under questioned. I mean, no, no questions about the first part. Uh, look, I have the following question. So when you made this normalization, right, I understood that uh, this also implies that what fluctuates is the amplitude of the whole spectrum and not that different spectral components of the spectrum Okay, oscillate. Uh, could all you of that happens. That, please? Yeah, all of those things happen. The whole amplitude rattles up and down. The different spectral components sh shuffle back. All of that happens. You can see that, right? There, there's curvature in, in the baseline, and it bounces up and down. It does, all, And the transformation matrix has enough terms to account for all of that. Um, and so it really fits to all of those kinds of features across a whole set of you know, a few hundred spectra, a few thousand spectra that we use to calibrate uh, that, that transformation matrix. And then on a shot to shot basis, it's able to capture and, and adjust uh, to, to, fit the, uh, to fit the edge pixels. But yeah, it, it does all of those things and it accounts and it, we can account for all of that. Okay, thanks.
and very nice, by the way, uh, CLS functions, very small noise. Okay, so very, very nicely done. I, I, I like that a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of averaging. Uh, yes. Okay, do we have more questions? I don't see any more questions. Okay, then I think that we could thank Chris and Oliver one more time. Okay, oh, thank you guys. Okay, and then uh, we will see you all in two weeks from now. Exactly. Thanks, everybody. See yep. you in two weeks. <laughs>